Right, guys, let's have a look. This particular slide, we already dealt with it, but it says understand the issue well. Remember we chatted about that? You need to understand the nature of the business. So develop solution alternatives. Remember we chatted about that? Okay. And then the last thing, identify the preferred alternative. Okay. So I've looked at this scenario. I've looked at that scenario. This is the best way forward. And guys, it can make perfect sense on a piece of paper. If I cannot sell it to my audience, it's going to fail. Correct? So your presentation, and that's why we're giving you 30 marks for your presentation. That presentation has to be 100% uh, um, correct. There can't be spelling mistakes. There can't be uh, assumptions, etc., etc. Because one assumption, you can lose your audience. Your finance guys, who watches that thing on, um, on DSTV, that, that program called uh, Dragon's Den? watch Dragon's Den? It's a BBC program. I've only watched one or one or two of them, but basically it's an entrepreneur or a group of entrepreneurs. They come to this particular group of people and the group of people that they're presenting to are highly successful and highly wealthy individuals. Why do I bring that point up? Because they're the people that either buy into the idea that the person's presenting on or they say, no, it's going to fail. So the person up here has to sell the idea to the people down there. And it's how well they do it which will depend on, 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 on how much money the people at grassroots level are prepared to give them. Okay, and that's why basically what you guys are going to do. So look at the, this one we've chatted about already. And you know this, guys, correct? This is like simple knowledge that we all understand and we all know, but we often we fail to do this. And look at what it says. Decision makers, know your audience. If non is a financial person and you've got no finance in your business proposal or your business case, She's going to pick. She's going to. She's going to nitpick nip, nip there. She's going to say, "Hang on a second. What about this? How much is it going to cost? What if this? What if that? What if we overspend? What if we underspend? Where are we going to get the cash flow from?" And if you haven't thought about that, she can actually make your whole proposal proposal crash and burn right there. Everybody been up in a situation before where you think everything's going so wonderfully well, and all of a sudden Sasha says to you, um, "Sasha, hmm. I never know if it's Sasha. Sorry, Sasha. Sasha says." Uh, hang on, Richard, but what about this? And you go, uh, been there? And all of a sudden it falls flat. So you need to think about those what ifs. Okay? <laughs> right, so different people, look at this, guys, we know this. But we, we, we fail to see this when, we, when we're drawing up a business uh, case. Different people make decisions differently. Mm. Who doesn't understand what we're trying to say? No. Money? Don't you understand? No, kidding. Okay, explain to me. <laughs> Everyone thinks differently and they look at different aspects. So you need to propose it in a way that it caters for everybody's needs. 100%. <coughs> and, that, and that's a difficult thing. What's up, yeah? Mm -hmm. right. So if you want to talk to the finance person, make sure your finance is in place. HR person that talks to the HR person. Mm -hmm. Management person talks to the management person. Executive summary talks to the executives. So it needs to talk to everyone in that particular way. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, very, very important. According to their beliefs and values determined by education, experience, background, priorities, and biases. Look at that, guys. There's so much information there that's so meaningful to us. According to their beliefs, are there Muslim people in the group? Are there Christian people in the group? You might say, Richard, come on, we're talking about religion. It's about knowing your audience. Mm. You can offend someone like that mm. Mm. if you say something, and I did it. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I know. Because I'm, I, I, I'm talking from experience. I was a student teacher. So I go down to a Jewish school in uh, Cape Town called Hertzlia Primary. I mean, you know, it's a private school in, in, uh, in Cape Town. Anyway, so I go in, three years in varsity. You know, you think you're young, you think you know everything. I go in, into the staff room, and I sit down and I take out my ham sandwiches. <laughs> it's a Jewish school. I almost got lynched in the staff room and was like almost uh, uh, the, the sacrificial lamb for the week. <laughs> so, so guys, you, you can make silly, silly mistakes without even thinking of it. So you need to understand and know your audience. Okay? Know their beliefs. Mm. Are you going to offend someone? Mm. Maybe your business is a cyclical business, and you're talking about Christmas or whatever. Okay? You need to understand and know your beliefs. So even if people in that group aren't celebrating Christmas, and you're talking about it, you can talk about it from a, from a different perspective. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And values. What are the values? Determined by education. So in other words, sometimes from a network point of view, don't you know people who went to the same school as you? Mm -hmm. And they think differently? Any, any St. John's boys here? St. Stidians? 
Say hey team. Any merits brothers? No merits brothers, okay. <laughs> Let's hear the schools that we went to, Sasha. Mondio High School. Ah, I'm a Mondio High person. Really? Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> but uh, what's your surname again? Uh, it's De Villiers. Uh, apparently after you left, yes, it just went... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, because I made it sound like it's <laughs> So according to their beliefs and values determined by education. So now imagine, if I was presenting, I'm an ex mondio high person, and I, I pick up, I find out that Sasha's, or I just take the, take the common decency to find out which school she went to. And I can talk to her from that point of view, straight away I've broken down that barrier, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And she's mm -hmm. more open to accept what I'm about to propose. Who disagrees with what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Brandon? Do you agree? I do. Definitely, okay. You know that you're presenting to a group, a group of people. Try and find out something about it. Not blackmailing stuff, guys. Mm -hmm. but <laughs> not find out some interesting information about it. Determined mm -hmm. by education, experience, background. Maybe you're proposing a particular uh, uh, business case and, and it relates back to a background. Maybe people that grew up in this particular part of the economy and you want to you you pick up your business case or you want your business case to address a need in that part of the um, economic segment. Make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. And you know that three people in your particular group come from that particular background. Priorities and biases. If you know you're presenting to a group of moms and what, what is going to be their big priority? Kids. Kids, correct. Work-life balance. So maybe your business case is around that, and you can sell it through that particular scenario. Okay. And priorities and biases. If, oh, that's a, that's a, a bit of a, an assumption, but it's also a bit of a difficult one. If you can tie into people's biases and get them to buy into, uh, uh, buy into your particular proposal. Mm -hmm. And often biases are around emotions, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can get, you know, we're going to chat about that more tomorrow. Now, this is an important slide. I want you to have this slide in front of you when you do the first part of your PMA. So let's go through it. It says, elements of a business case. And there it all is, guys. Everything, so you don't have to learn this off by heart. You just have it in front of you and make sure that every single thing is there. So look at the first thing, title page. And I'm going to show you that the title page is very, very important. Who's the title page important for? The reader. The reader. I need to pick it up and identify straight away what is this about. Okay, so your title has to be short and catchy. Okay, table of contents, and I'm going to show you also on the title page. It's also very important to have a a brand. So let's say it's Woolworths. Make make sure you've got that brand symbol there on that title page as well. So I know this is about Coca-Cola. It's about Covidia. It's about uh, um, FND. Whatever it is, I need to see that brand name. There. Table of contents, is that important? Yes. Definitely, definitely, it's very important. Because remember, table of contents is a system of checks and balances. Now please don't say to me, hang on a second Richard, I'm already doing a table of contents for my assignment, do I have to do another one? What's the answer? Yes. Yes, yes because this is the business case. So you have to do a table of contents for your business case. Table of contents for your assignment always happens. This is a table of contents for your business case. Executive or project summary, we're going to chat to you what, what that is about. The mission statement, who knows what that's about? Good, we're going to learn about all of these things. Objectives of the project. Performance measures, what ifs? This is how we're going to measure or evaluate the, the, particular, uh, the particular advantages or disadvantages of this particular proposal. Needs assessment. Technical analysis. Uh, project work plan, look at that one. Financial plan. A lot of people, especially in the economic times that we find ourselves in, they're going to be, be, uh, be looking at the financial plan, correct? Mm -hmm. Brandon, you want 10 million rand for this particular proposal? Are you crazy? Where are we going to get the money from? Mm -hmm. Brandon can say, yes, I've talked about that. This is where we're going to get it from. From a finance point of view, if, he's, if you can show me that he's thought about that, I'm going to be, I'm going to be bought into that particular proposal. Okay. Right, a capital asset manager plan, partner profile, and then an appendix for any graphs or tables or anything that you want to add to your particular um, business case. Now, I want you to open up your books on page, you're on 7 of 38, and I want you to look at page 10 of 58. And guys, that's why I said to you verbatim, we're actually going to go through a lot of this just so that everybody understands 110% exactly what is expected of them. Are you happy that I sit? Mm -hmm. Can we make it more, more homely? So it says elements of the business case. Look at the first one, title page. And can I ask Brandon, why don't you just tell me what is involved in that title page? So 
Um, the title page is the first impression a reader gets of a business case. Make sure it is neat and orderly, simple, balanced, and easy to read. It contains the title of the project, the project designation, um, name of organization, date of approval by organization. Okay. And something that they haven't really included there is if, if it's a brand, if it's a branded company like Coca-Cola, I would put that brand, that brand, that brand on the actual title page as well. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. So I'll pick it up and it, it, straight away the reader knows what it's about. Look at the next one, it says table of contents. Why do we do that? Bianca, please read. A table of contents <coughs> lists the major headings in the business case and the page on which each is found. Remember to number the pages in the document. While it is the last section completed, it is placed <coughs> immediately following the title page. Okay, who doesn't understand that? That sounds a bit contradictory. Mm -hmm. It says, although it's the last section completed, it follows the title page. Mm -hmm. It's to ensure that you actually update the page. Like this. Right, okay. So in other words, you can only do your table of contents once you've finished your whole assignment, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. But you put it first, first or second after the title of, or after the, uh, the, 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 the title page. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how frustrating this is for knowing your audience, You're talking to an HR person, a financial person, and the financial person, what are they going to do? Look at the table of contents and go to the financial plan, correct? Yeah. HR person might go to what? Mission. Mission. Maybe or needs assessment. Or needs assessment. Okay? They're going to go down, they're going to look at specifics. Now all of a sudden I see page number three, I go to three, and I can't find the financial plan. And I spend maybe 30 seconds or 45 seconds looking for the financial plan. Am I going to be frustrated? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because straight away you want me to buy into this particular plan or proposal, but you haven't even taken the decency to make sure that everything is correct in this particular proposal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't you lose your audience before you even start it. So the table of contents is vitally important and it has to be very accurate. Victor Maleng, won't you read the next one please? Uh, executive or uh, project summary? Business. Very important section, guys. A lot of the executives, they will pick up on this. And if they don't understand what you're trying to say, you're going to lose them already. You to read for me, please. Uh, this is your first and most important selling tool. Uh, it is where you create a critical first impression of the project. So it is important to summarize the most important elements of the project in a uh, conscious and uh, compelling manner. Okay, does everyone understand what you mean by what you mean by the word concise? Mm -hmm. So clear, clear and short. Okay, no fancy words that only you understand what that particular word means because you looked it up in the Oxford Dictionary. Okay, it needs to be clear and concise. Right, can I ask uh, Sydney? Won't you read the next one? The, the uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. Okay, guidelines for writing the executive summary are listed below. Describe the project precisely and consciously. Concisely? Uh, concisely, avoiding excessive descriptive ways. Tell why the project is necessary and why it is the best solution. Outline the most important, important benefits of the project to the organization. Outline the costs and the major disadvantages, if any. Right, that's an important one. So you're telling your audience, this is the proposal, but there are disadvantages and these are the disadvantages. So you're showing them ratio sonation, you look at both sides of the coin. Okay, there are definitely advantages, but there are also disadvantages. Tommy, won't you carry on please? Include objectives, proposed solutions, benefits and costs, risks and key dates. Summarize the most important reasons for recommending the project. Limit to one to two pages in length only right after the business case is completed. Interesting, eh? So it comes third, but in actual fact you write only you write the executive or project summary only once you've completed the whole business case. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, because only then you've got a clear direction of where your business case is going. Can I ask Pierre, won't you just read the next paragraph please? Okay. Keep the exec exec executive summary to two pages or less. Do not in include technical des descriptions. Concentrate on explaining your reasons for undertaking the project and what the benefit will be for your organization. It may help to do a point form first draft before writing your, your business case. This could clarify the important element of the plan. Write the final draft after completing the plan details. You guys agree with that? 
Mm. Okay, that's good. I agree with it. But what's the problem then? What's a potential problem? Not a problem, but a potential problem. Don't you think there's a potential problem of you only seeing the potential opportunity or problem from your side? Maybe you need a couple of people involved in that first draft. So in other words, seeing it from another mind's eye. So Bianca could maybe get her manager or manageress or maybe the person uh, uh, making the tea. Even they've got a different perspective to that particular opportunity of affecting the business. Have you got me? Mm -hmm. So just get a variety of people to help you with that, with that, with that first draft. With me. Even mm -hmm. if you draw it up and you say, what do you think about this? Brandon could pick it up and say, hang on a second, Bianca, what about this? You haven't, you haven't, you haven't even spoken about this side of this particular proposal. The anchor could say, geez, I just, went, I just assumed that everybody would know about it. Okay, so it's simple things like that. I would definitely, from a proposal point of view, try and give it to as many people involved in that situational part of the department so they can give you a, a viable feedback. Point taken? You would like to disagree with me? Sasha, you all right? No, I'm fine. Okay. Mary Ann, are you waking up? Um, Sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry, Bridget. Bridget. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if this sentence is, is, is correct or. Yes? I don't understand very well. It may help you. It, it may help to do a point form first draft before writing. It's, so point form means we're going to do this, 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 and then you can put that draft into a proper proposal. So what is the first? Give me, give me an example. So point form. So it's like brainstorming at first, saying what what type of ideas you want to put into the right. executive assembly. Okay. So let's go back to the water pumps. So in point form would be um, metal, copper, plastic, mm -hmm. uh, maintenance, repair. Mm -hmm. That would be that would be point form. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't mean anything to anybody else because you've got, 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 got everything in your, in your head. So then you move on to actually drafting up that, 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 that business case. And now you're right. So right, our first proposal would be to replace the, the, the water pipes with metal. Mm -hmm. And this is the scenario. Replace the pipes with plastic. The point form it would just be metal, plastic. Copper, whatever. Okay. So that's what they mean by point. Okay, yeah? yeah. Right, look at the next one. It says mission statement. This is also very important, guys. This is a concise, once again, to the point. Simple and to the point. General statement of what the project intends to achieve by completing the project. It explains what is to be done. Look at the question, guys. What is to be done for who and why? So straight away, three questions are answered there. If possible, do not exceed one sentence. Is that difficult? Very, very difficult. Organizations can sometimes spend hours, maybe even longer than that, just on a mission statement. Okay, because it needs to talk to everybody. So once again, it explains what is to be done, number one, for whom and why. So if you can address those three questions, then your mission statement is concise and to the point. Okay. For example, the town of Rosebank will construct a four-lane bridge over the Lazy Hollow River in order to attract industry to its industrial park and to facilitate traffic traffic flow between the town and the M1 highway. Clear and concise. It's, uh, it's what, what is to be done? A bridge. For whom? The town of Rosebank. And why? To help a, 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 a business between the city and the particular town. Makes sense, guys. Right? Mm -hmm. You have to address those three questions. Objectives of the project. Can I ask you a few? Why don't you do something, please? Objectives of the project. What precisely will be achieved by completing the project? State the objectives clearly, one short statement for each, without accompanying arguments or documentation. This appear in the body of the report and in the project summary. It should be clear to the reviewer, however, how these objectives relate to the objectives of the funding program. Objectives are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Smart. Timely. Timely is uh, time measurable. Okay, guys. Now, just with that, have you ever have you ever um, looked at objectives? And um, because it says state the objectives clearly, and it says objectives are specific, measurable. So, in other words, our company made a million rand next year. Our objective, a million rand this year. In turnover, our objective for next year is to make a two billion rand turnover from one, one from one million. Is that measurable? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it's unrealistic. Mm. 
I don't know if it's measurable. From 1 million to 2, two billion or 1 billion, I don't know if that is measurable. How do you measure something like that? Is it realistic? Also, it's not realistic. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to measure it. How are you going to be able to measure? Have you got the capacity to move from a million man turnover to a billion in one year? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, you need to ask yourself that particular question. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you are... But it depends on what they're proposing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if they're now yeah. proposing to open... A cure for eat. <laughs> or <Yeah>. even <laughs> other company, uh, expanding the company in different mm -hmm. provinces or countries yeah. and... That, yeah, so what are we saying here, guys? It's very important that we understand the nature of the business because mm -hmm. then it is measurable. Mm -hmm. But just talking about it now, I don't know how a company could jump from a million main turnover to yeah. a billion or two billion main turnover. Yeah. Maybe if you're a Shuckleworth, yes, it could, literally. There, there are situations where, where, where uh, scenarios like that could be measurable and realistic, but invariably we want to look at realistic goals. Mm -hmm. You can't be unrealistic because automatically Brandon's sitting there and saying, hang on a second. How is this even possible? You know, I, I, I'm sitting here, time's going by, I'm wasting time, I should be busy on something else, and now we're looking at these airy-fairy ideas. Mm -hmm. Have you sat in meetings like that before? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's quite scary as well, correct? And you think, hang on a second, we're taking up time, we should be spending this time on something else. Mm -hmm. Something more measurable, something more realistic. So those are important things, and I hope you guys highlighted them. So your objectives have to be all of those. Remember SMART, s just say it for me, what is the S? Small. Simple, specific. Or, simple specific. or specific, yes. Measurable, measurable achievable, achievable, realistic, realistic and timely. Time, timely or time, uh, 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 time measurable. Okay. So in other words, there's nothing worse than having a proposal. We're going to do this. When? Oh, I don't know. But we're going to we're going to do it. <laughs> but by when? I don't know. But we're going to we're going to do it. It's going to be great. It must be time measurable because you can't evaluate it if it's not time measurable. Would you agree with that, Sydney? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but I've, I've got a bit of a question there because awesome. I also want to make sure that we do it right. When I'm saying actually I'm measurable, uh, am I actually specifically uh, explaining uh, what you call uh, the things that I want to achieve if they're going to be attainable? I'm sorry. Yes, attainable. Attainable is a good word as well. Okay. So, so are we able to measure it? So, for example, let's say, let's say. Our objective is to talk to a million people yeah. in this particular segment of the economy. How are we going to measure that? Yeah. I, I don't know what the answer is, but you need to address that how. Okay, and that's what measurable means. So, so whatever your objective is, you need to ask yourself, how do you measure that particular objective? So can, can, you, can you think of an objective? Think of an objective for me that you want to relate back to your assignment? Okay, basically I think from my side, I'm simply... Okay, I'll just actually uh, just give an idea of the topic which I would like to probably target. Like for instance, uh, constructing uh, what you call uh, residential uh, places for students at Mpumalanga University, for instance. And then I'm simply going to be saying um, I will be able otherwise to construct probably uh, flats, kind of. Obviously, we careful, careful of words, kind of. Okay, yeah. they're very wishy washy <laughs> statements, but not. No, no, I'm being critical here because that's what we do, especially when we're presenting, and that's why I'm giving you guys chances to talk as well. When we talk, if we find our backs against the wall, sometimes we start to waffle, correct? Mm -hmm. And we and, and we make silly, uh, uh, silly mistakes with regards to our wording. And when you say kind of straight away, you've lost me because I know you're wishy washy. So have very, very power, speak with powerful words, speak with specific words. Okay, so you carry on. All right. So that's obviously, I'm actually, it's a dream anyway. But you know, what I'm trying to say is, uh, let's say for instance, this is Mpumalanga University that I'm actually targeting to offer residential places for the students. I'm, sim I'm actually going to be building about 100 rooms, obviously providing uh, what you call a kitchen and a bedroom, and also study area. And then, um, obviously, targeting the, what you call the number. I'll be obviously looking at the number of students that I will think otherwise I'll be able to accommodate. So, with that kind of idea, the number versus the amount of money that I have and the space that I have to build that, then I think it's realistic. I'm not going to answer achievable. the question. Brandon, what, what did you think of that proposal? It's, it's, measurable. Measurable. it's measurable. It's good, it is measurable. Yeah. How is it measurable? I've got a problem with it. How is it measurable? For me, it's measurable in terms of he's got, he's got his idea, he's got, he knows how many rooms, 
I, I don't think he knows how many rooms. Mm -hmm. said he knows said there's a, a need for rooms. He said a hundred. No, 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 no. But that's uh, that's how many rooms he's going to make. But he's making the assumption mm -hmm. that there's a hundred rooms needed. Um, you, you see the difference, mm -hmm. guys? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sydney's making the assumption there's a hundred rooms that are needed. But there's no market research telling you that there's a hundred rooms that are needed. Okay, I think no. I just touched based on the fact that I will look on the number of students. Yes. That I will be will be my target. Excellent. And so that would be your market research. Yes, that's my okay. market Good. research. Yes. So obviously if it's probably hundred students, obviously I may I may opt to say two students per apartment. Yes. And then that would mean that if it's hundred it means fifty. So okay. then obviously I'll change to say two hundred students I will target. Then therefore, hundred apartments okay. that I'll build. So, sorry, guys. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to be critical and rip Sydney apart, but this is what's going to happen in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Straight away, you're going to have a finance person there. And you're going to say, Sydney, you're making the assumption that every one of those hundred students can afford the accommodation. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, from a, to come back, I haven't lost the plot. But when you talk about measurable, yes. all of that has to be measurable. So, yes. have you determined that every one of those hundred learners? is financially viable, able to pay back that particular loan or, or rent or whatever it is. Yes. So straight away, your objective sounds great, but it needs lots of work. Yes. So you need, to, you need to talk about price. What, what, what is the price you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna set to that? Yes. Is that viable for the learners? Okay, no, obviously with this idea, I'm saying this idea to, to you and also everybody sitting around, being that obviously it's an idea that I'm going to target. That and I think it's great. And right. Yes. Okay. But the reason why I'm saying that you must do this yes. is because as you do this, you're making the assumptions that everyone's on board with you. Yes. But I've said, hang on a second. Yeah. How, how can you determine, from a measurable point of view, yes. that everybody can afford that particular part? So you need to sell that to me, the audience. Okay, Sydney. Okay. So that's one particular loophole. I agree with Brandon. It is good, but there are loopholes. Loophole, so you need yes. to think of those contingencies. Okay. Are you thinking of other accommodation? Like you spoke about accommodation with a, uh, correct me, a kitchen and a dining room. What about accommodation for the learners that can't afford that? And you've got cheaper accommodation for them. Mm. I don't want you to ask no, answer yes, the question. No. I want you to, because that could be a contingency. Yeah. What happens to the other learners who can't afford any accommodation? Where, how are you going to accommodate them? Have you thought of that? Yes. You see, that could be another contingency. Okay, so those are all the what-if scenarios. Okay, Sydney? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that would, that would attain to measurable. Jobs created, upgrade, or, or attained. Job quality may be listed. So job quality. So uh, Sydney, to come back to your particular proposal, yeah. it wouldn't be job quality, but it would be um, accommodation quality. So maybe you can say in this particular apartment, we're going to have this furniture. In that, in that apartment, we're going to have that furniture. In that apartment, we're only, uh, we only going to have the bedroom. And if the learner wants to go watch TV, they're going to have to go to a TV room or something. Yes. You with me? Yes. And you've got you've showed contingency, and it's measurable with the different learners that you get. Because with the first proposal that you gave me, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm being critical here because this is what's going to happen in your proposals. Yes. You're making the assumption that everybody's earning the same amount of money, correct? Yes. And that's what you have to be careful of. Okay. I have a question. Who are we proposing to? Are we proposing to um, Pumalanga University? Are we proposing to the bank who we need finances from? Excellent who question. Are we Answer it for me. Are you going to tell me who you're proposing to? Oh, yeah. is it, everyone is different. So Pia is going to say to me, I'm proposing to a finance person, or this person, or that person, and that person. So you're going to actually identify the group that you're proposing to. And I'm going to show you tomorrow with your presentation that you can maybe... Uh, not, not, you can actually hone in on Brandon because you know that Brandon is this kind of individual. You know that he comes from a finance background or an HR background. You know that Mary Ann comes from this 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 kind of uh, kind of background. So it's very important that, and that's a very good question to ask yourself before you even start with the business case. Ask it again. Who are we proposing to? Who are we proposing to? Write it down. That's that, that's the, that's so important. Would you would you agree with that statement? Mm -hmm. So you have to tell me. I'm going to be. Good proposing or presenting to this group of people. And I'm going to show you, we're going to keep on coming back to that question, Renier. So please ask that question again, okay, tomorrow when we do our presentation. But keep on thinking about that particular question. You see why that question is so important? Okay. Right, okay, so that's uh, new or retained investment in the community. Ah, that's important. New or retained investment. Remember that's part of CSR. Corporate social responsibility, relate back to our pistol again. Remember social, the S. 
the social, how are we giving back to, uh, to, to society? Okay, um, new, uh, sorry, new partnership or linkage created, what is that? That network. By doing this, we, uh, I propose that we're going to have a, a, um, a link to this part of the business. We can diversify into this part of the business and it's creating another opportunity. Problems or issues resolved? Chat about that. Increased tax revenue. Don't finance guys like to listen to that. Mm -hmm. Because that basically what are you saying about saying that? You if your tax revenue goes up, what are, what are you what are you in theory, what are you saying to you? Your Making more money. You're increasing your turnover. Yeah. And return on investment? Not really, but you're increasing your turnover. Yeah. If you're increasing your turnover, in theory what you're telling me is your market share is getting bigger. Yeah. Doesn't mean your profit's getting bigger necessarily, yeah. but it means your market share is getting bigger. Maybe in business it's not always about profit initially. The end, well, I suppose it's always about profit. Always about profit. But, but, but initially, <laughs> initially, it could be about market share because from okay. that market share, you could actually gain more profit. Can I, can I justify my statement? Mm. Pick and pay? Woolworths and checkers. Who was top dog about two years ago? Pick mm. and pay. Mm. Checkers. What if pick and pay, uh, in, uh, nobody, uh, nobody's out from pick and pay. What if, what if pick and pay been involved in over the last year and a half and they're going to be carry on, they're going to must probably be involved with it for the next year and a half? Are they expanding into petrol stations? Excellent. Pick and pay stores. They, mm. they, they, they're in the process of just building a tremendous amount of stores. I think the, the, the last count was 234. I actually spoke to someone today whose son works at pick and pay. And she was saying that they actually uh, are going to be opening up 400 stores. So I, I don't know the exact number, but it's a tremendous amount of stores. Mm. Is that going to cost money? Mm -hmm. It costs huge amounts of money. So stores. what happens? Invariably, when you're doing that, are you going to upset customers? Have you been to a, into a pick and pay recently? Haven't you been there and often they're painting or they're busy tiling and they're mm. changing this? Yeah, Correct, yeah. and you're working around it. So what, what happens? Invariably, customers get upset and they go to... Checkers. Another provider. Who are the other providers? The big ones? Checkers and Woolworths. Woolworths and Checkers have gained that market share. Remember from a from a um, sigmoid curve point of view. So remember Richard Maponia from your mm -hmm. business management? We always said that Richard Maponia, he was great from a sigmoid curve point of view. What is this? The life cycle of a particular product. So how does this relate back to what we're talking about? You can tell me. Well, pick and pay have now reached the peak, so the initiative to avoid uh, the decrease is to actually go and create footprints. Right. But now the other side, where checkers have now picked up, where they started losing, um, they're actually following the same initiative as pick and pay with regards to their mission to Grow. create. Okay. Footprint. And think about who shops at Woolworths. Okay. Uh, Straight away, when I asked the question, answer me straight away. Brandon, why do you shop there? Quality. Thank you. Why? Mm. Quality. Okay. Quality. Who doesn't shop there? Why? Straight away. Price. Okay. Price. Okay. You see our piece. <laughs> okay. Quality and, and, and price. price. Okay. <laughs> but quality around product. You see piece product. Okay. So what they're saying is that um, we don't shop at Woolworths because of price. Who, who likes to shop at Woolworths? What happens when you go into a Woolworths store? Now. The first thing that you see when savings. You savings. Mm. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Mm. So they're picking up on that particular market, and there's always uh, um, posters eating for 150 rand, under 150 rand. You've seen those posters? Mm. So what's happened from a sigmoid curve point of view is pick and pay. We can argue that they've actually lost this particular base here. Now they're growing. So in this growth, they've actually lost this. And what is this? And now they're starting another sigmoid curve. What is this here? That shows loss of market share. This loss has been picked up by pick and, uh, checkers and rules. It's so okay. And to get that back, it's going to be very, very difficult for, for pick and pay too. Okay, guys. So, very important there. Increased tax revenue. Very, very important. Increased volume of domestic or export sales. Remember we spoke about this around the citrus, the, the citrus scenario that we chatted about this morning. And then new products services or technologies to be developed or utilized. What, what is that about? Purple cows. Okay, purple cows related back to our sigmoid curves. What is the life cycle of that particular new product? 
Okay. Barriers to growth that will be overcome. You can chat to me about that. Barriers to growth that will be overcome. What is our pot possible things that could be a barrier from achieving what we want to achieve? 100%. Give me an example of something. Um, so you look at pestle. Uh, okay. So you, if, um, if I look back to his um, business case, what he's trying to achieve, there could be legal factors that could be a barrier or there could be uh, financial factors that's a barrier. It just depends. Where what about, what about, sorry? No, I wanted to say from your example of how BMW has diversified going into the financial sector, there's always compliance. Okay, so uh, yeah. compliance from a pistol point of view, yeah. okay, yes. Yeah, so if they want to venture into that, there will be certain things that they need to adapt to. Okay. What about this scenario? Sorry, mm, I just want to say that um, it's almost answering your mission statements. Hundred uh, percent. What are those three questions? Give them to me again. What is For why? whom? What? Why? And why? 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 Okay. So, what are you proposing? For whom? And why? So it's literally those those three questions. But barriers to growth that might might be overcome. Don't you think culture is a big thing? Cultures, culture can be a very, very big thing. Remember in the stats, that scenario around Coca-Cola. Can you remember that scenario around Coca-Cola? Can, yes. okay, can I remind you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So remember in your, in your, in your stats uh, 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 module, they, uh, they, they gave us a case study around Coca-Cola. And they said their sample group in Coca-Cola was 200,000 people, correct? Yeah. Of those 200,000 people, 99% of them, because Coke was going to change their... The uh, they, they, not, not their brand, but their, um, their okay. recipe, yeah. their recipe of Coca-Cola. Yeah. So 99% of the sample group said, hey, we love it, we love it, we love it, we love it, okay? So Coca-Cola decided to change because 99% of the research said that they should change. And they changed and in the first month, they got 400,000 complaints. 400,000 complaints because the people didn't like the new taste of Coca-Cola. And the guy thought, wow, we did the statistical research, we did the market research, how could the stats be so wrong? And they spoke to, they, uh, the guy brings up this, this, uh, this um, chat that he had with, uh, with an old lady, and, he, and, and this old lady phones him up and says, listen, I'm very, very upset because Coca-Cola has changed their recipe. And he says to her, well, when last did you had Coca-Cola? And what did she say? That's true. No, 25 years ago. And he says, but why are you upset that we changed the recipe yet? She says, because it's part of my culture. It's been part of the American culture for so many years. And now you've changed something that's embedded in that American culture. So why am I bringing that up? Why is it so pertinent to the South African situation? Put up your hands straight away. Who eats Ace Mini Pop? Okay, who eats Impala Mini Pop? Who eats Star Mini Pop? Star. Star. See, he doesn't even know. Nyala. <laughs> Nyala, Nyala Mini Pop? Now, I promise you, from a producer point of view, you go from Johannesburg to, to KwaZulu Natal. People will not eat ice. In Johannesburg, they eat ice, yeah. right? Ice is tops. I, I, I also eat, I, I like in part all ice. But if you go to KwaZulu in, 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 in Natal, the guys eat Nyala. So it's a cultural thing. So you need to buy into that particular cultural And you need to overcome yeah. that cultural barrier. Yes, sir. It's a difficult thing, eh? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sasha, you had your hand up? No, no, no. No, no, yeah, yeah. Can you can you think of anything else that's uh, that has cultural barriers? Well, um, halal meat. Hundred percent, hundred percent. If you've got different cultural or communities that only buy a certain brand, and now you're trying to sell another brand, mm. that's a difficult barrier to break. Mm. So barriers to growth that will be overcome. How are you going to overcome those particular barriers? Think about something simple, Colgate toothpaste. And you go into the locations and all of a sudden you sell uh, Sensity. Is it going to take off? Is it going to take off? Guys, it's something as simple as a product like toothpaste. You might say, Richard, millions and millions of tubes of toothpaste are sold every week, correct? Yeah. In the locations. And invariably people will buy Col Colgate. Why? Because it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now all of a sudden you want to try and bring another product in, it's going to fail if you don't understand that culture. Agreed. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's an important one. Right, performance measures. Can I ask uh from me? Won't you read for me, please? Are you happy that we sit, guys? Mm. Yeah. I think it's more okay. Right, from me. 
Performance measures evaluate the success of the project. They indicate how the project will meet the objectives listed at the beginning of the business case. The business case will 1. List the plan objectives 2. State the evaluation criteria for each objective 3. Outline how or by whom each will be evaluated. Very important. Okay. So, there's, so you're trying to eliminate bias there. It's not just me evaluating. Brandon's going to evaluate, bank is going to be evaluate, and peer is going to evaluate. So you're trying to get a realistic evaluation of this particular proposal. Okay. Needs assessment. Whoa. You spoke about this. Can anyone just pull Brandon in? And some of the other guys that, uh, that came a little bit later. Why is needs assessment so very important in a proposal? Yeah? Explain to Brandon. From the HR perspective. Any perspective. Why is a needs assessment so important? We said at the beginning that uh, there's the two major questions that we, sh we should ask before uh, proposing any, any business is to identify the needs and the wants of, 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 of the... Telling. Is to identify the needs and the, the want of the the target people that you, you need to propose to. So it's very important to always uh, correctly identify those needs. 100%. Yeah. And what we said there, Brandon, is we said that just because something is a need in one particular market area, it doesn't mean, and just because it's been successful there, it can actually fail if we take it and we try to implement it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Just think of something that is, uh, we, we, we found it actually worked one in one particular uh, market segment, that was transferred over to another market segment and try and relate it to your own business functions. Can you think of something that failed horribly? Or worked well in one particular market segment but didn't work well in another? It's talking about like needs and wants. Mm -hmm. Yes. Simple things like that. Just thinking, so important for us is the head office has these new uh, Nespresso machines. So you just press and you get it. Now they implemented, they try to do that at the at the factory, but um, it's not like higher grade, but it's it's new technology that the people aren't familiar with, and you know, it, no one it has to be maintained. So what they actually want, they're going to go back to the old. Just give us our tin with our sugar and that's fine. Sure, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So it's not that we're saying that that group of people is un uh, you know, unintellectual or whatever. It's just saying that this, they haven't been upskilled from a technological point of view, from an understanding point of view. And the assumption was made that everybody will just understand that machine because everybody at the other workplace mm -hmm. understands that machine. Mm -hmm. So a needs assessment, assumptions comes into that needs assessment. So let's read it there. The needs assessment analyzes the problem and explains why the problem needs to be corrected. So a coffee machine, why does it need to be corrected? Well, it's going to cost money and you're upsetting the people. So can you relate the upsetment of people back to productivity? Who does not function well with their first cup of coffee in the morning? Okay, it's going to be a serious issue for me as well. Okay, so you can look at some. Do you know that riots have been started as a result of coffee and sugar? I'm being serious. Mm -hmm. Businesses, there's case studies that have been where riots have been started as a result of inferior coffee and sugar. There's a joke that I think the Civil War starts, the American Civil War started because they threw tea overboard. Oh, is it? I haven't heard that. One. Okay. British tea but overboard. just guys, why the problem needs to be corrected? So from a coffee machine point of view, why would it need to be corrected? Because you've got unhappy staff. So you'd have to justify that and motivate that. Okay? It provides the information as to whether the project should be undertaken at all. The report, in abbreviated form, becomes part of the business case. Look at the problem. What is it? The coffee machines aren't working. Clearly stated. Uh, why does it exist? Um, it was the solution to a particular problem. Correct? Am I correct in saying that? Uh, who, who is affected? All the factory workers, correct? Um, what is the extent of the problem? Lack of productivity, um, discontent among the factory workers, etc. What is the damage? And this is an important thing. What is the damage liability if the problem is not fixed? Let's hear from you, Brandon. I think the deal is um, it's time consumption. Time consuming and the fact that you're, you're taking your workers down to that um, unsatisfied. I mean, you've got the dissatisfied line and the unsatisfied line. You, you take them back down to, you know, killing the morale of the company. And 
um, upsetting because they only maybe have a 15 minute break and it, the machine's taking two minutes just to, to put out one cup of coffee when everybody could have had their cup of coffee you know, by just making themselves quickly and then gone off okay, and eating their food in the same time. Do you see so, how important this is in a business point of view? Okay, so you might say, oh, Richard, why are we talking about coffee and making coffee? That's important in business. If it's downtime and that's the, that, that's the time that the workers get together and chat and have that downtime and collect their thoughts and that, it's an important time, correct? And if that's not a productive time, it can, it can have huge implications for the business. And you need to try and sell that to them. Okay, so environmental assessment, assessment, if applicable. If it's not applicable, that's fine. Expert or full firm providing assessment. So remember, it's always good to have an authority figure. Okay, uh, to give you some kind of feedback there. Result of assessment, environmental approval, Ministry of Environment. So that's only if it's applicable to your particular proposal. Benefits for correcting the problem, physical and environmental, financial, so you would definitely have a financial implication, correct Brandon? Yeah. Okay, so the coffee machines, you wouldn't have to maintain them in that, you just basically move it back to the simplistic tin and sugar, okay, and people are happy. Reduced costs, would there be reduced costs? Yes, there would be a new that Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right, technical analysis, this is an important one, Bianca can ask you to read. Are you guys happy that we go through this like this? Yes. Is it just a very clearly defined what is needed for requirement one of uh, your film? The technical analysis outlines the technical information used to make the decision and tells why the proposal represents the best or most cost effective solution. It describes technical problems encountered in existing situation, what alternative solutions were considered, why this is the best course of action to choose, why this is the most cost-effective solution, or if not, why it was chosen, what innovative technologies are being used. Important, all of those things. Mm -hmm. I'll give you 30 seconds, just go through it again. Mm -hmm. 